tales for dark nights. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre. And I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Our first tale tonight comes from author Douglas Greenwood, entitled The Art of Jacob Emery. Ghost stories? No, we don't have anything like that around here. We do have the story of Jacob, but that's about as close as you'll get. You really want to know? Well, I'm not supposed to tell you, but all right. Just no interrupting. I don't have patience for it. How to describe Jacob Emery? Well, I guess you could say he was the kind of guy who was easy not to notice. But that's not to say he was a bad kid in any sense. Many people in this town considered him the most reliable person in the area when it came to helping out with odd jobs, but he never really excelled at anything. He was the living embodiment of the expression, Jack of all trades, ace of none. This was largely due to his own lack of ambition. He dabbled at damn near everything this town could offer him, Automobiles, radio operations, store management, what have you. But he never stuck with anything. His friends and co-workers went after him about it a number of times. But everybody got the same unsatisfying response. It just wasn't enough. Needless to say, any friends he kept were either very patient or avoided the topic altogether. Perhaps it was inevitable, then, that Jacob would leave to go abroad. I don't remember where it went, but I think Gertrude down the street knew before she passed on. You'll have to ask someone else if you ever get curious. In any case, no one even tried to stop him. Everybody thought that a little travel would stamp the restlessness out of him, or else feed it until it was no longer an issue. Hell, we even gave him a sending-off party, which I thought was pretty nice of everybody. Anyway, he was gone for uh, six, maybe seven years. I can't remember. You'll have to check with someone else about that, too. He came back eventually, and when he did, he had clearly changed. He was amiable, energetic, all smiles all the time, and we all quickly learned why. He showed us a souvenir he had brought back. A solid black stick, the length of a pencil, but the texture of chalk. We all wondered why on earth such a simple thing would cause such a spring in his step. Until he gave a demonstration. He took a piece of paper. And with his stick. God, there's got to be a better word for it. With his stick, he drew a crude circle. It dropped like the stone it resembled and rested on the border of the paper. It didn't leave the paper, but it acted out on it, sort of like an image from an old movie projector on a screen. I son, I, I know how crazy that sounds, and if you feel like playing skeptic, 
Or you can leave an old man to his delusions, but I know what I saw. Even if everybody's been hushing it up, and that stone he drew dropped. Jake even passed around the paper. And as it was being passed, the stone rolled around as the paper tilted. None of us had any words for it. Hell, what was there to say? What we were seeing was beyond words. He continued drawing demonstration after demonstration for us. Stick figures and various pageants and plays doing everything from fighting each other to making perfect human pyramids. And we all agreed that it was incredible. That was all the incentive he needed. He announced that he planned to put on shows for pay, for rent and food, and that in these shows he would draw anything the crowd members wanted. That we talked about at length, and he eventually convinced us that it would be safe, his drawings ethical, the practice lucrative and unique, and that the attention would not extend beyond the town's borders. Poor Jacob. If I'd not been so swept up in the moment, I might have read the signs right then and there and saved the sorry son of a bitch by snapping the terrible thing in half. But I was younger. We all were. We saw no problem with encouraging him to share this incredible thing with everyone else. Now, he, he didn't have any big radio or television connections, mind you. And this all took place a decade before the creation of the Internet. So he did what all people on a shoestring budget do. He advertised his show with flyers. Flyers might not mean anything to you city folk, but in a small town they tend to garner more attention. What's more, Jacobs managed to stand out by having little figures jump up and down and whatnot to get people's attention. His first show must have attracted at least 60 people. Probably even more than that. His shows were fantastic. Someone would shout out a scene from a play or a comedy sketch, and Jake's hands would fly over a white wall like a bird. He'd been holding back when he made that stone, that's for damn sure. His illustrations were all spot on and he could draw an incredible human figure in minutes. Come to think of it, I don't remember any of his drawings taking more than ten minutes to make. They were all vivid, detailed scenes, too. Not only could you see a knight charge a castle, but Jake would draw the castle's interior as well, like a wedding cake split down the middle. You could see the knight scale the walls, fight his way through levels to the dungeon, fight back with the princess, leap off the castle parapets onto his getaway horse, all in complete silence. The scenes weren't realistic, but that was part of the appeal. None of us went in there expecting something real. And when a scene or a sketch was finished, he'd cover the wall with white paint. This was good, in a way. It gave these shows a time limit, so that when he'd finished with all of the four walls in the room, everyone knew the show was over until the paint dried. Jake, meanwhile, was changing in a bad way. You may recall that I mentioned that upon his return, he'd been extremely energetic. Well, that energy, that vitality or fervor or whatever you want to call it, it never left him, not for an instant. It seemed, in fact, to grow in him, and he enjoyed it all too much. His eyes grew wider over time. He began to sleep less and less. His statements and opinions grew more radical and frenzied, and though he'd never been a pushover, his newfound assertiveness was starting to make people nervous in his company. A month or two passed, and Jake's audience grew like wildfire. Nearly everyone in town paid to see Jake's art in action, and he had to rent out larger and larger places to accommodate his spectators. He no longer stopped after one scene was done, but moved directly on to the next. Sometimes this had the intriguing effect of causing scenes to mingle, 
which the crowd loved. The subject matter became more wild and immoral. The monsters grew more bizarre and creative. The fighters used more impossible weaponry, all for the sake of the crowd's interests. Jake's lifestyle became steadily more indulgent, which we figured was a result of the money, and he became a drinker and a womanizer. Some of those women claimed they had woken up in the middle of the night to see him scribbling with that stick on a drawing pad, a gigantic grin on his face. And while most of them said they'd assumed he was drawing them in the nude, there are rumors that one or two of them got glimpses at the notepad. Those anonymous few supposedly said that those drawings absolutely weren't nude pictures. But neither of them, whoever they are, will say what he was drawing. Don't bother looking for the notepads, though. They're all gone now. I'm getting off track. The point is, he was hitting the bottle, and that's important because it was that drinking that would eventually ruin everything. On the night of one of his performances, as he walked in front of the cheering crowd, it was immediately apparent to everybody that he was completely drunk. I was in the front row, and I could smell the bourbon on him ten feet away. The show started, and as usual, he went through a bunch of sketches and scenarios the crowd recommended. When, as the show was drawing to a close, someone asked him to draw himself. Everyone cheered that idea. I guess they'd been wondering what his creations thought of him, and he evidently obliged. No sooner had Jake finished connecting the final two lines on his coat than every single character he had previously drawn on the vast, expansive wall stopped and looked directly at the new illustration. Lovers stopped kissing, Clowns stopped laughing. Robots stopped fighting pirates. Everything stopped and looked at the Jacob illustration. The raucous enthusiasm of the crowd died almost instantly. I remember Jake's face at that moment, pale white, reflecting the terrible comprehension of his mistake, looking desperately for the cans of white paint he'd forgotten to put out before the show. As for everyone else, they were looking at the fake Jacob. That Jacob reached into his jacket pocket, pulled out a black stick of his own, and as we all watched, he drew a door. He pushed on his side and the door swung open, allowing him to walk through onto the floor of the auditorium. What followed was an absolutely hellish pandemonium. People screamed and ran for the exits as Jacob's characters, both those currently on the wall and those which had previously left before being covered up, ran out of their own exit, throwing pies, shooting lasers, blowing fire and poison in the impossible. I was near enough the exit to escape and gave only one backwards glance and the scene will haunt me forever. Jacob Emery was being dragged, kicking and screaming, by his own creations through the door his copy had made. How the fire started, I don't know. But the auditorium burned to the ground that night. I have no idea how many characters escaped, what happened to the fake Emery, or exactly how many people died. The fire brought the fire departments from cities up to over a hundred miles away. In the days that followed, the police and shadowy government officials descended on the town and hushed everything up. They took the flyers and any art Jake had made and swore everyone to secrecy under threat of arrest and imprisonment. The fire was formally attributed to a cigarette in the garbage can during a basketball game and we all eventually went on with our lives. All traces of Jacob were erased, as though he had never existed. In retrospect, so much is clear to me. Jacob hadn't been creating illustrations. 
Illustrations don't move, much less act or attack. They're just images people see. A collection of lines and light and shadows made to look like real things. Jacob had been making life, actually thinking things into existence in some alternate dimension, using a power that was never meant to fall to mortal hands. He became drunk on his power. His punishment was probably well-deserved. Incidentally, the government screwed up on two different accounts. They did a damn good job silencing everyone, but proof remains. The auditorium ruins are still there, you know. I hear they're going to start reconstruction soon, which will wipe out any remaining irrefutable evidence, but I went back there once, just once, several years after the fire. Amidst the rubble, covered in ash, I saw something squirming. I looked closer. It was Jacob Emery's hand on the wall. It looked exactly as it had three years ago, sweaty but calloused, I remember, but it was constantly flailing, as if it were still attached to a body writhing in flames. How the government officials, in their painstaking thoroughness to wipe out all trace of Jacob, could have missed that, I will never understand. That was mistake number one. Number two was those creations. I don't know how many escaped, but I do know that there is no way the government agents found and caught them all. I will say only this. Those tall grass meadows on the outskirts of town? Don't ever go into them. Ever. You were asking about those white figures you've seen at night, right? This town doesn't have ghost stories. Our final story tonight is brought to you by author Dylan Charles, entitled The Song and Dance Man. There are few left alive who remember the song and dance man. Time has claimed the ones that survived the long night, and I'm sure they went willing to meet their maker. Life takes on a strange tint after a night like that. The ones still left, Bill Parker, Sarah Carter, and Sam Tannen, they don't want to talk about it. Sam's lucky his brain started to turn to porridge a few years back, and now he has trouble figuring out how to put on his pants. He got an early reprieve from his memories. He doesn't wake up night after night, the music still playing in his ears, with tears still drying on his cheeks. The song and dance man came to Belcarn with little fanfare in the fall of 1956. I had just gotten out of high school and was working as a stock boy at Hardy's Hardware, I was there the afternoon that Sarah Carter burst through the door, making the bell over the door jingle like mad. George, you gotta see what's been set up by the bandstand. There's this huge tent up, and this man standing in front of it yelling like a carnival parker. Sarah was out of breath, and had obviously run from the park and all the way down Main Street. Her hair was whipsawed every which way, and one strand stuck to the end of her nose. She gave a quick puff and blew it out of the way, waiting for me to react. With Sarah, I was always two steps behind and running to catch up. The girl had energy in those days and in an unlimited supply. I stopped rearranging the nails and said, There wasn't anything up there when I walked by this morning. When to go up? She shrugged her shoulders. Quick raise and drop. Dunno, but it's up. And you gotta see this guy, he's all dressed up, head to toe, and can he talk? Oh boy, he can talk. I thought about it and checked the clock. It was near about five, and time for me to quit anyway. All right, well, let's go check it out then. Sarah grinned from ear to ear and was gone. I didn't doubt she was telling everyone in the gang, the ones that were still in town anyway. 
Most of us scattered to the four winds after graduation. Only a handful of us remained in town, and only a handful of us were on hand to witness the dance. I walked down to the bandstand myself, not bothering to wait for the others. Most likely, Sarah was already there waiting for us. I met up with Bill as I passed the drugstore where he worked as a soda jerk. What the hell is Sarah talking about, George? She blew in here and blew out again before I could ask her anything. Bill was a big guy, the tallest and heaviest guy in our class, and I just about cracked up the first time I saw him wearing that little peaked paper cap McCleary makes his soda jokes wear. Bill doesn't really like to be laughed at, though, and after the knot under my eye went down, I made sure not to laugh at him any more. He's a good guy, aside from that temper. He was the best guy on the high school basketball team, too, though he's one of the few guys who got kicked out of a game. He threw another player halfway down the court, and they were on the same team, too. Bill said the other guy elbowed him in the gut. It had to have been an accident. No one would have done that on purpose. We both walked down the street, Bill smoking a cigarette, a habit that caught up to him in 1995 when they removed his red lung. At the end of Main Street, we crossed Buchanan and entered the park. Normally, at that point, we would have been able to see the bandstand perched on a hill near the center of the park. During the summer, there'd be concerts, performances by the school marching band, the church choir singing some hymns, you know, that kind of thing. Once, a couple of kids from the high school had put together a pretty good rockabilly group, but someone on the parks committee passed an ordinance that banned rock and roll in the park. Small towns, you know? But now there was a huge faded yellow tent blocking the bandstand like the kind in the circus, or the kinds those old revival ministers like to use when they're feeling the spirit, and they like to feel your wallet, too. There was already a pretty large crowd around the tent, and as Bill and I got closer, we could hear the fellow that Sarah had told us about. It sounded like a carnival barker, all right. Bill and I walked faster down the path that led to the tent, We pushed our way up through the crowd and up toward the tent where we thought the man was. Come on, everybody, it's getting close, getting close. We're going to have ourselves a heck of a time tonight. Yes, indeed, a heck of a time. We'll be singing, we'll be dancing, I promise you that. And the song and dance man always keeps his promises. We couldn't still see him. Still too many people were blocking the way. It looked like the whole town had showed up to see the song and dance man. Bill tugged on my sleeve and pointed. I followed his finger and got bug-eyed. It was Reverend Harper, the Baptist minister. I'd lived a good long time, but I ain't ever seen a man that could thump a Bible harder than he. Harper preached against the evils of sin. Sin in drinking, sin in smoking reefer. Sin in smoking tobacco, sin in lying, and most of all, sin in dancing. Yet there he was, lining up to get inside that tent, too, because he certainly wasn't preaching. We waved at him, Bill waving with the hand that held the cigarette, and that old Baptist turned red as the Red Sea and turned and walked away. Bill and I grinned at each other and kept on walking toward the front, and toward the song and dance man. Finally, we broke through the crowd, and there he was. He stood in an old crate, splintered, and looking like it was on the verge of collapsing under his feet. On the grass, beside him lay a black fiddle case with gold trim along its edges. It looked old, older than the crate, older than the town. It seemed like something ancient. He was all angles, knees, elbows, and shoulders. He was tall and gangling, his body moving and bopping to the rhythm of his words. He wore a red and white pinstripe jacket, looking like he belonged in a barbershop quartet. A straw hat sat on his head, always getting pushed back or pulled forward by his long-fingered hands. Long six-fingered hands. I started when I saw that. 
I had read that some folks are born with six fingers, but reading about something and seeing it, that's eh, two different things. His eyes just about flashed blue lightning as he spoke, and sparks nearly flew from those white teeth, and he just never stopped talking. He didn't stop for breath, for questions, or anything. He just kept up that pattern like his very soul depended on it. All right, all right, all right. We're getting close, getting real close. Yes, we are. Are you ready to dance? Are you ready to sing? Because I'm ready to play my fiddle. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Got a fiddle at my feet, and I'm ready to play. Ready to make those strings sing. Can you believe it? He'd clap his hands, and that's as close to a pause as he was willing to do. Sarah and Sam came up to us now, having found us in the crowd. Sarah elbowed me in the rib and said, What'd they tell you? Looks like you should be in a carnival trying to get us to see the bearded lady or something. Sam nodded his head in greeting to us, which caused his glasses to slide down his nose and he gave them a short push back up where they belonged. He was as tall as Bill, but nowhere near as Bill. He was the smart guy in our gang. You had to have someone like him around to tell how to do things like take apart the principal's car and rebuild it in the school gym. Not that we ever did anything like that. What's he selling? asked Sam. A dance, I figure, I said. What's it cost? The song and dance man must have heard him because he said, What does it cost? I hear you ask. Why, it doesn't cost a dollar, it don't cost a quarter, it don't cost a dime. Folks, this will cost you nothing. Just get on in and dance to the song all night long. We looked at each other. It was a good deal. A little free music and space to dance. There wasn't much to do in town back in those days, and there still isn't. This was almost too good to be true. The song and dance man stopped now, a minor miracle in and of itself. He dug deep in his pocket, pulled out a gold watch, checked the time and then grinned a grin that must have shown every one of his teeth. He pocketed the watch and said, Folks, it's time for the dance, so come on in, come on in, everyone, because it's time for the dance to begin. And with that, he hopped down from his crate, grabbed it up with the fiddle, and darted through the tent flaps. Sarah, Bill, Sam, and I nearly got mowed over in the rush to get inside, but we were still the first ones in. We stopped short when he pushed aside those big old flap tents, but were quickly driven inside. It was huge inside. There was a hardwood floor beneath our feet that looked like it must be oak, or a dark, dark oak, polished to a mere shine. There were candles and holders all along the tent pole posts, and when I looked up, I couldn't see the ceiling for all the darkness. It was like looking up at a starless night sky where the moon didn't dare show her face. The crowd kept driving us, and more and more people poured in. It wasn't just the young people, either. There was Mrs. Crenshaw, our junior year English teacher who was in her fifties. There was Mr. Hoskins, the principal. There was good old Reverend Harper still looking embarrassed, but also like he couldn't help himself. It really was the whole damn town. Hell, even the mayor was there with his wife, standing and talking with the chief of police. Soon, everyone was inside, and the murmur from all the talking was nearly deafening. It was already getting warm in there, and I was feeling cramped and claustrophobic. We were all looking for the song and dance man to see where he had gone. No one looked up, so no one saw him until the first pull of his fiddle bow. There he was, on the center tent pole, sitting on a small, wooden platform, about twenty feet off the floor. God knows how he got there, because there certainly wasn't any ladder going up. He dangled his feet over the edge and held his fiddle in one hand and the bow in the other. And the fiddle and bow seemed to be made of that same dark wood that the floor was, and gleamed in the candlelight like a thing alive. I almost doubted that the fiddle even needed the song and dance man to make its strings hum. We all looked up at him, and he grinned and jumped to his feet while the crowd gasped, worried he might plummet into their midst. And then he began to play. He made those strings sing. 
I haven't heard anyone play like that before or since, and I thank God for that every day. It made the air around us crackle and spark. It loosened the joints and jolted the mind. You felt the urge to move deep into the bone, buried in the marrow. I grabbed Sarah's hands and we began to move across the floor and everyone followed suit, some with partners and some without. Some were doing the foxtrot, some were doing a waltz, and some of us were doing the twist. We danced, moved, shuck, jived, rocked, and rolled. I passed Reverend Harper, moving his feet in a clunky box step with Eloise Grendel, an old battle-axe of a Catholic. I saw the mayor's wife waltzing with Dan Adams, one of her firemen. I swirled with Sarah, moving across the floor, bumping and jostling with the people around us. It was hot and getting hotter in there, and it wasn't long before it smelled of sweat and bodies moving against bodies. I felt dizzy, but we kept dancing together, kept dancing and not stopping. It was a while before I realized that the song and dance man was singing, too, but in a language I didn't understand. He lorded over us, standing on that platform, making his fiddle sing and sing. His bow rose and fell, slid back and forth, side to side. He played like he talked. There were no breaks or pauses, just a manic deluge of tunes while his tongue curled around the words that had no business being said in this world. I gave my head a shake as I spun with Sarah and I realized my legs were tired. My feet ached and my lower back was beginning to throb. I checked my watch and realized we had been dancing for a solid hour. I shook my head again, trying to shake off the dozy feeling that was clouding my thinking. <coughs> Sarah, I cleared my throat. I had only spoken in a whisper. My tongue felt thick and funny. I tried again. Sarah. Louder this time, but she still didn't respond, and we kept dancing. I shook her, but she didn't respond. I kept shaking her until I realized I was doing it in time with the music. So I just tried to stop, and I couldn't. I couldn't stop. Underneath the fog, I began to feel frightened. I began to see the faces of the other people now, and I saw their terror. Reverend Harper's face was grown redder than it was before. Sweat poured down his face, but he still kept moving, twirling Mrs. Grindel around and around, her head lolling from side to side. She had fainted, but her feet were still moving. We moved past Bill, who danced with Susie Watkins, and I saw her frightened eyes darting around the room. But Bill bobbed his head in time with the music, and his glassy eyes looked at nothing in particular. The song and dance man laughed from his perch and kept playing, tapping his feet. His eyes were glowing in that dark, humid place, they glowed and glowed, and light glanced off the bow with each sweep. I heard a scream and swiveled my head to watch a woman drop to the floor, holding her leg. She had cramped up. I was envious. She got to stop. She got to rest. My own legs felt like dead wood, and the ache in my back had deepened. Then her partner stepped on her ankle, and I heard the crunch from across the room. He was still dancing his eyes blank and empty as he moved. She screamed again and started to crawl away, but instead stood up. She started to dance, bringing her weight down on the broken ankle again and again and again. I turned away because uh, well, I couldn't block the sound of her sobbing. The music ran on. I checked my watch again, and it was three hours now. We didn't flag or falter. We kept up the same speed as the fiddle, the damning fiddle, wrapping our feet against the floor, never mind the blisters that burst, never mind broken toes or broken ankles, never mind that deep pain buried in the spine that refused to go, never mind old hearts and bad knees. We kept up that frantic pace as one mass, a bobbing, thumping, jumping creature with one mind. Reverend Harper died at one point. I watched it happen. He was holding up the still-fainted Mrs. Grendel, who, who feet still moved with the music. When he dropped her and fell to the floor, 
He twitched once, his feet beating a quick staccato rhythm, and then was still. Mrs. Grendel got back up and kept on moving. I watched Harper as I danced, trying to see if he was breathing. He wasn't. I swear to you, he wasn't. But he still got back up. He was dead, but he still got back up and began to dance again. He turned to look at me and grinned the song and dance man's grin. His eyes were red, filled with blood from whatever had broken in his brain. I watched as a single red tear rolled down his cheek. I shut my eyes and kept moving. Harper wasn't the last. He probably wasn't the first. The old and the sick were the first to drop, no matter what it was. Exhaustion, heart attacks, hemorrhages, somewhere deep inside. They died, and then they got back up and kept dancing, grinning their grins. I passed Lizzie and Sam. He had lost his glasses at some point. His eyes darted around, terribly aware. I looked at his leg and I saw a jut of some bone tearing through his denim jeans. There was a trail of blood behind him, and as he swirled, a spray landed on the legs of the people around him. He stepped on that broken leg, twirled on it, and jumped on it, all in time with the fiddle. The night passed. I remember stepping on something at one point and realized I had just crushed Mrs. Dempsey's right hand. She was lying on her back on the dance floor. She had been stepped on time and time again. I could even see a man's shoe print on his stomach. Her head had been caved in and her chest beneath her dress had a sunken look and still she was trying to get up and keep moving. The smell of blood mixed with the sweat and I couldn't breathe anymore. The air was thick and from all around I could hear cries and screams, but nothing that drowned out the fiddle or the song and dance man singing. And then it stopped. I danced one more step and then stopped myself. I looked up at the platform. We all did, craning our necks upward. He was checking his watch. All right, folks, that's all for tonight. The dancing is done and the morning has come. You may leave if you can walk, and you should walk quick, because this song and dance man is going to be gone. We all stood there like stunned cattle, then marched to the tent flaps. No one ran, because they couldn't. It was a miracle we could walk. Sarah stepped ahead of left, but I stayed behind. I turned and looked, and saw at least twenty people still standing there. Harper was among them. They were all grinning, their eyes empty. They stood and made no sign of wanting to leave. Go on now, friend. The song and dance man has what he wants. But he'd be glad to add you, too, if you tarry and dally too long. I looked up at him and saw him smile, and then I turned my back to him and left the tent. When I turned back again, he was gone along with the people inside. That's the story of what happened. The others won't tell it or pretend it never happened, never mind that twenty people vanished that night, the mayor's wife included. They'd rather not think about it. Sarah and I took Sam to the hospital over in the next county, far from folks that knew what had happened. They had to remove his leg. Sam was quiet before and was quieter still after, pulling odd jobs that a one-legged man could do. He doesn't move around much nowadays. Just sits on his porch, a cane across his lap, and massages the stump with his hand. Says it bothers him on cold nights, and warm nights, and wet nights, and dry nights. Bill left and joined the army and stayed in long enough to fight in Vietnam, and won a bunch of medals. He came back and settled down to drink and drink hard. And if you want to find him, you can find him in Eddie Dixon's bar. No matter how drunk he gets, though, he doesn't talk about that night. None of us saw much of Sarah afterward. She came through the best, but that's how she always was. She left and went to college, but like Bill, got pulled back to Belkine. She teaches over at the high school now, teaching English to the juniors. 
I stayed here, bugging away at the hardware store. I ran it for a while. But now I don't do much of anything. I sit around with Sam, talking about things sometimes, though not often. If I stay late, if I stay too long, I'll see his eyes go glassy behind those Coke bottle lenses, and he'll disappear into himself. And I'll catch him humming a faint trace of a song, and the hair on my neck stand on end, and goosebumps rise on my arms in great knots. My foot will start to tap out a small bead on the hardwood porch, and a big, wide grin will spread across Sam's face. The grin of the song and dance man. Thanks for joining me this week for tonight's regularly scheduled Tales of Terror. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Tonight's program has been brought to you by Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly, your host, Otis Jiry. Got a scary tale of your own you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com for your chance to have me bring your sinister story to life. If you enjoyed what you heard, and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode, and leave us a five-star review and a comment for your chance to be entered into a weekly prize drawing. Your feedback means a lot to us. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more and haven't already... Be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for more than 500 free audio horror stories or the Otis Jiry channel, my own digital home away from home, where you'll find dozens of previously released horror and sci-fi stories from yours truly. If you'd like to connect with or support me and CTFDN, visit the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights Facebook page or at their website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com where you can support our programs by becoming a patron and get access to hundreds of stories all ad-free. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with another pair of terrifying tales that'll keep you up all night. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.